everybody out there in UK Comebook land, I'm here with Claire McIntosh to talk about the latest book, Hostage. Hello, Claire. Hi, thanks for having me. No problem at all. Um, really, really love this book. If you could give us a summary of the plot, please, Claire. I can. It's always hard to talk about thrillers, as you know, without spoiling them. Hostage yeah. is uh, a contemporary take on a locked room mystery. So it takes place on a 20 hour long haul flight from London to Sydney, uh, where a flight attendant, Mina, is presented with a terrible ultimatum. Should she protect the plane and the people on it or protect the lives of her family who are back at home? And so that's the dilemma she's faced with. Uh, and it's a very twisty thriller uh, with lots of surprises. Yeah, nice, nice, quick, nice, quick summary there. Uh, I was just curious as to the lock room element because earlier this afternoon we did we did have a discussion about lock room with another panel. So I was interested as to why you went for the lock room angle. I love locked rooms, so I love reading them. You know the classics like Agatha Christie uh, did some some brilliant locked room mysteries. Ruth Ware's locked room, or sort of, they're not all locked rooms, but they're often closed cast, where you've got a very yeah. specific, defined area, and you know that that you're not going to have a new character barreling in halfway through the book. Uh, and she does them brilliantly. So I've always wanted to write one, and then I was on a long haul flight to. Seattle I think it was it was about 13 hours and it was such a long time to be in the air and I was reading about the fact that this 20-hour flight was was planned there's already a 19-hour flight that's the longest non-stop they call it ultra haul but there's a 20-hour uh, one planned from London to Sydney and I just thought you know it's it's such a weird setting that we we go onto these aeroplanes and we eat and we drink and we go to the bathroom and you step over the person next to you that you don't know and you sleep you know if, if you're in normal economy class you sleep this far away from a complete stranger you know it, it is more intimate than some people are with their partners um, and that just struck me as a really interesting setting for a locked room thriller so that was the start of hostage yeah i'm uh, really interested as in to uh, what well, how you managed to do um, so many um, police procedurals uh, standalone because there's not many people that can, not many people that do that. Um, why do you? Yeah. I, I don't. I mean, it wasn't a conscious decision not to write a series, and I I don't think I'd ever really thought about whether I wanted to write a series. I I just had stories that I wanted to tell, and my books are generally quite quite different you know there are lots of similarities but I Let You Go is very different to I See You for example I See You is more of a traditional police procedural slash thriller whereas I Let You Go has definitely got more elements of say women's fiction or um, domestic suspense uh, family drama Hostage is different again it's an out and out thriller although there's a little bit of, of that sort of domestic element that, that comes in so they're all very different and it just depends on what the story is and how it presents itself and also what the world is like and so far every world that I've created has felt like a standalone world it's not felt like something yeah. that demanded a return or invited a return but that's slightly different to something that I've just written. So I've just written a book that has a world I do want to return to and a character that I would like to see again investigating another crime. So I don't know for certain, but I think I might have written the first book in a, a potential series. Fascinating, because the, um, I, I'll, let, I'll let you go. There was a lot of... Um, demand for that to be a series after the partnership what made you decide to not go there to start because I, I don't think it was a a partnership that really was sort of significant enough to, to yeah. want to come back to you know i it was my first book i don't think the characters in i let you go were as developed as my later books um 
and you know and that's not not to sell the book down the river I, I'm very proud of that book and it you know changed my life it launched my my career it's been incredible and there's a lot about it that I'm very proud of in terms of plot um, and emotion but actually I don't think that Kate and Ray who are the police officers in in that are two people that I necessarily want to know more about and therefore want to tell a reader more about and and that kind of is is my benchmark for a, a series whether I'm thinking about writing it or whether I'm reading it are these people that I want to know more about and I want to spend more time with yeah you do a lot of reading yourself what do you look for when you're reading a police procedural um that you you might have um, thought as a guide for doing that I don't read very many police procedurals, not, not straight out detective novels. I read a lot of crime, a lot of thrillers, a lot of domestic dramas and psychological suspense. Um, let me, um, I'm going to get my reading journal, which lives on my desk. And I'll, uh, I'll tell you what I've read recently um, that I loved okay so this is interesting so the last book that i loved because i write down everything that i read but i never talk about books that i didn't love the last book that i loved was one two three four five six seven eight nine books ago and it was three hours by rosamond lupton which is not a detective nor novel it's not really a, it's not a psychological thriller it, it, it's a thriller it's a crime novel yeah. um about a, a siege in a school and it was brilliant. But the last detective novel, well, in fact, I can't, I can't see one in my list of, I always put a little star next to books that I've loved. And this year, I have not read a police procedural that I've loved. Now, that's partly because I don't gravitate towards them. Yeah. It's also because some of the ones I've ha I have read are lacking in authenticity which is what i really love in a book i like to feel that i am there and that's a tough thing for someone to do if you know i'm i'm reading as a former police officer and if i read yeah. a book that's set in a police world i'm looking for a level of authenticity that might not be there and you know that's fair yeah. enough because not all crime writers are ex-cops do you think um that's um has made it difficult for you to think because you're thinking about the authentic world that you, that you used to be in. Yeah, a little bit. I, uh, I I do get put off by not errors. So I don't mind I don't mind factual mistakes. And I'll give an example of this because I know she won't mind. So Lisa Jewell does not care about accuracy in terms of police procedure and we've talked about this online and you know she won't mind me, me saying it um and so i can read her books and i don't care that oh, i'm trying to think of an example some okay someone being someone paying to bail someone out of a police station does not happen in the uk right we don't do that that's a very american thing but you'll find it in lots and lots of uk novels people walking into police stations and posting bail for people i don't care about things like that what i care about are things like the way police officers talk to each other or the fact that you know a detective is dealing with the sort of job that a uniformed officer should be dealing with. I, 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 I care about that sort of thing. And it takes me out of the story. And they're also, they're not, they're not difficult things to get right because nowadays you can research, you know, that there, there, there are, there are lots of uh, fly on the wall documentaries in police stations. You can learn how police officers talk to each other. You can pick up the, the jargon and the sort of the, the feel for a place. So I think it, is a relatively easy thing to research. Given, given that, that it's an easy thing to research, you say, um, what was it like moving into other genres for you? Because that must have been a bit diff more difficult for you to research when you're not having done that. Yeah, it, it was hard. And I felt quite a big responsibility to get them right because my first three novels were in a police world and I could write with authenticity and so I built up a reputation for being a writer that you could you could trust you you could 
rely on the fact that what I was going to tell you within these stories was going to be accurate. And then it would be very unfair of me to present a reader with a book that wasn't accurate. So initially, the, the first time that became uh, an issue was with After the End, which of course was not a crime novel. So After the End is a family drama about two parents who disagree on the medical treatment that their son should receive. And that was a world I had to research in terms of um, medical treatment and uh, the legal ramifications of parents who disagree. And then with Hostage, I know nothing about, knew nothing about aeroplanes, about flight attendants. Um, so I spent a lot of time researching it. I, I spoke to lots of pilots and lots of flight attendants. I spent a lot of time on um, message boards and forums where uh, flight attendants hang out and, and specifically where new or aspiring flight attendants ask questions of experienced or retired flight attendants and that is an eye-opener because they all the, the the old lags want to show off so they're sharing all the stories and they're using all the jargon and the new ones are hungry for information so they're asking all the same questions that I want to know you know how many times do weapons get smuggled on board and what sorts of things are there and what happens when things go wrong and you know all sorts of things so what happens when a, someone dies on a plane uh, which is something that happens in Hostage. It's not really a massive spoiler. It is a crime novel after all. And it's uh, something that I found the answer to on, on a message board. So I did a lot of that and I went to fly a simulator. So I wanted to land a Boeing 777 at Sydney Airport. And funnily enough, they won't let you do that in real life. Even if you are a Sunday Times bestseller, they will not give you a Boeing 777 to fly. But they will give you a simulator. So I took my son, who's 14, and he did a brilliant job landing this plane. He plays a lot of computer games and he glided into Sydney Airport. I had a go and I don't play computer games and I'm all appalling I have no hand-eye coordination at all can't play tennis can't do anything like that and I do that thing where you overcorrect. so you, yeah. you see the plane going slightly and I go oh no we have to go this way and so I came into the airport like this and then crashed and and you know burned uh but that was also quite useful for book research <laughs> yeah there's a lot of that a lot of elements that you would, would have learned from these forums um what was the um hardest bit what you didn't include in the book that you thought you might do? What was difficult was um, getting the balance right between things that probably wouldn't happen but could happen. So, you know, this the Hostage is essentially a hijack book. It's a book about a group of people who want to hijack a plane um, and, and want a flight attendant to help them. And you know, that doesn't happen very often, but it could happen. And and that that was my kind of criteria for, for lots of things. So, for example, I use a weapon. I'm being careful because I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. There is um, there is a weapon used in the book. Um, and in some on some planes, that particular item wouldn't be on board. But on some planes, it will be and it can be. It has been. And yeah. that's enough for me to then say, right, well, I'm going to have one of those on board my fictional plane because it has happened in the past. So so a lot of my research that was kind of, you know, do I include that? Don't I? There's also a um, is this a spoiler? I don't think this is a spoiler. There is an emergency exit hatch. Okay, so on a plane, on a long haul plane, you've got um, sleeping compartments up above the, the cabin. So when you're, if you're in economy, above you is a, a dormitory where the staff will sleep and they sleep in kind of low bunks with curtains around them. But it's basically like, it's, it's like a, a room covered with mattresses and each mattress has got a curtain around it and that's where you'll go yeah. to, to sleep. Now, I use that in the book, and I'm not going to tell you how or why, but there, there are people there and they don't come out of there um, until the end of the book. Now, there is actually an emergency exit hatch. And 
that's probably the only place where I've deviated from reality because if I kept that emergency exit hatch in my book, then I would have ended up with more staff potentially to overcome the terrorists. And actually that didn't, yeah. that didn't really work with my story. So I just didn't, didn't have that. So that, you know, that, that's an example of something that I found out and chose not to use. Yeah, it would have been a bit more like Air Force One kind of thing. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, and um, what when you were looking at transport made you made you want to use it until until your books because you used it in there. I see you as a, a trains. I think what is it about transport that makes it good um, background for your books? It just um. It's quite interesting, isn't it? I don't think it's going to become a theme. I don't have a, an urge to write about, I don't know, what's left, uh, cars, commuters on, on the M40. I'm not sure that would be a bestseller. Uh, it, I think what I'm interested in is, is people and people um, in proximity to other people and strangers in particular. And that's something that happens on trains and it happens on aeroplanes. Um, so it's it's just it's just an interesting dynamic it's like what i said at, at the start of our chat that you you're spending time with strangers in a a weirdly intimate setting and yet you might not speak to them at all and everyone has a different reason it's quite a leveling thing you know you're all making the same journey some of you are making it for positive reasons some of you are making it for really sad or distressing reasons some people have money, some people don't, you know, it, it's, um, it's, yeah, it's just an interesting environment. It's, um, it allows for um, dramatic things to happen in small spaces, I suppose. Um, what, what was, um, what was your inspiration for book three, though, because that was com completely different with it being based partially on a, um, Partially on a true story, I think, wasn't it? The well, third, yeah. yes, but we can't talk about it. We can't talk about it in that context, so <laughs> should we leave it there? Yeah. Yeah. So, let, so book three is Let Me Lie, and Let yeah. Me Lie is is bait. Well, is it bait? The the twist in Let Me Lie is based mm -hmm. on something yeah. that's happened in real life. But if I were to mention it, that would destroy you know one yeah. of the twists in the book. So we won't do that. Um, but, yeah, so that what I wanted to do with that was look at this particular true life story, this true crime story, and think about the wider implications of it. So not focus on the person who did the thing that we won't mention, but what that did to friends and family and, you know, how they coped with it. Yeah. Um, so I, I really enjoyed writing that. And that was a that was a a book that came after a false start. So I've, I've had a couple of false starts and I think, I, I know that lots of people in um, your group will be writers, aspiring writers, aspiring authors. And so I always find it quite helpful to hear uh, disaster stories from published authors. So I'll just, just slip a little one in now that I have thrown away as many books as I've published since I became published. So lots of people think that perhaps you you have lots of books in your bottom drawer or on your computer before you get an agent, before you get published. But after that, it's plain sailing. And the opposite is true for me. So I didn't write any books. Well, I wrote a, I wrote a rom-com, but I haven't thrown away lots of books before I got published. I Let You Go was, was my, my debut. But then I wrote a book after I Let You Go, which just wasn't as good as I Let You Go. And I Let You Go had been so successful, had sold a million copies in 40 countries. And I had to follow it up with something that was going to be a bestseller. And if I didn't do that, then my career would be tricky, I think. And I knew that and I wrote a book and it wasn't good enough. And so I threw it away and I wrote I See You. And then I thought, well, I'm never gonna do that again. So I started writing my third book and I got halfway through and I thought this isn't isn't good enough. It's not as good as I see you. It's not as good as I let you go and it has to be better. So I threw that away as well. And then Let Me Lie was the next book 
that that you know was good enough and was published after the end was fine I didn't have a false start with that one um but then I wrote another another book and I wrote the whole thing and I edited it and it was you know all ready to go but it wasn't good enough so that book has been parked as well and then I wrote hostage instead so I I do have a bit of a track record for writing books that actually aren't up to scratch um, and, and recognising that and not publishing them. Um, and Let Me Lie came after one of those full starts. Well, there's nothing wrong, no, nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that. And I, um, I must admit, I do like to hear that kind of story because it makes give me, gives me a lot more confidence because I've got seven, seven books on the computer that I've only got to 50,000. And I'm just wondering what your advice is about when to decide to st start with something what's what's the thing that goes up in your head that makes you think ah this one's not working so for me it is it's one of two things so often with me it's been the concept if i boil this book down to the concept is it strong enough a hook to stand out in a crowded market to entice someone to pick it off the shelf. So I Let You Go was all about the twist. And, you know, that's what everyone was talking about. And everyone wants to discuss it. And to discuss it, you have to read it. So that was sort of word of mouth. I See You was a really strong hook. We do the same thing every day. We're creatures of habit. Commuters follow the same route. If you do that every day, then you're predictable. And predictability makes us vulnerable to attack. So that's a really clear concept that people can relate to all over the world. Let Me Lie was a similar situation in that um, it's about a family, about a woman who, who feel, whose parents committed suicide, who took their own life um, in identical circumstances a year apart, but someone tells her that they didn't kill themselves so she launches a, a murder investigation so it's quite easy to describe it's quite hooky um hostage you know we we've just talked about so mostly it's the hook and if the hook isn't right then it's never going to be strong i can i can work on the prose and i can create amazing characters but actually if there's not a a driving question then it, yeah. it's not a strong enough book and then the other thing that happens is that there's just no magic and that's what happened with the last book that I shelved. So the book before Hostage, which didn't have a title. And it was about a white. So this feels now like I've written it for a, a political reason. But this I wrote this book two almost three years ago. It's about a white police officer who arrests a young black man and the, there's a, a, um, a struggle and the black man dies. And then the story is told from the perspective of two people, the wife of the police officer who is uh, arrested and um, investigated for manslaughter and the girlfriend of the man who's died. So I wrote this book and it was a really, it was a book I really wanted to write because it's a really important story. And because I know a police officer who, went to trial at the Old Bailey um, and I know the impact that it had on their family and I interviewed lots of people whose family had died at the hands of police and obviously it has an enormous impact on theirs and I wanted to, to be able to show the, the two stories. Wrote this but before um, bef before everything happened with George Floyd and before the Black Lives Matter movement um, sort of soared it already wasn't working. There just there wasn't a spark. There wasn't yeah. the kind of the magic to that story. And I said to my editor, I, I can't make this work and I don't know why, but it's missing something. And it might have been the people who told the story or it might have been the structure. I don't know what it was. I still don't know. But I said, I need to put it to one side and write something else. And the something else was was hostage. And then in the meantime, lots of things have happened in publishing and in the wider world around own voices and Black Lives Matter. And I don't think I'm the right person to tell that story in the way that I'm telling it. So I might return to that theme, but in a different way. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you bring up own voices because um, I am, I'm, 
item and add I subscribe to own voices having their own opinion, but I kind of like want to avoid that label myself. So half my books have been from the point of view of someone disabled, and I've decided to get uh, decided not to go with them because I'm uncomfortable with the idea. Um, from you talking to um, other authors in the community, what what's your feeling on that? I think it's really it's really complicated, isn't it? Um, I I can understand why you don't want to pigeonhole yourself as you know. I have a disability. I only write characters with disabilities because you're so much more than that, and life is so much more nuanced than that. Um, I I think that writers should be allowed to write whatever they want. It's about knowing that world as intimately as your own. So in the same way that I would not write a book about the aviation industry without doing my research, uh, without being able to write authentically as a flight attendant, as a pilot, I also would not write a character who had a disability or was a different ethnicity to mine unless I had done the right research that enabled me to write authentically yeah. as that person. And I would also want to ask myself, is this a story that, that belongs to someone else? So in the case of, of Hostage, th this isn't a story that belongs to any, anybody. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not disempowering someone by telling a story about a flight attendant who has to make uh, a life-changing decision. In the case of the book that I shelved, it, you know, is it, I, I don't know. I think it's open to debate. Uh, there are possibly other people who could tell that story. I might come back to it, but I think I want to do an awful lot more thinking and a lot more research first. That's absolutely fair. I'm just thinking as to um, when, it, when it comes to things like that, um, um, what, what is it that um, what is it that because um, I don't know whether you wanted to mention this because after the end is very personal <laughs> if you don't want to get there that's fine but yeah okay. I'm happy to talk about after the end uh, after the end um, is is not my story but it is inspired by something that that happened to me so my yeah. Uh, son was critically ill when he was a baby and suffered uh, a brain bleed which um, damaged every part of his brain um, and we were faced with the decision to make whether we continued to give him treatment um, in the knowledge that his life if he survived would be very short and that there would be no part of his body that would be unaffected so he would not be, they predicted he would not be able to talk or walk or uh, swallow or um, see or hear or have any awareness of the world around him um, and that was one path we could take uh, and the other path was to remove him from intensive care and to let him die um, and I asked the consultant what would happen if my husband and I disagreed and she said you have to agree because the alternative is unthinkable. So the book that I wrote in After the End was a book about the unthinkable. It's, it's a book yeah. about a couple who are faced with exactly that decision but whereas my husband and I did agree, this couple don't and, and it, it follows uh, both possible outcomes um, from that decision, whether this child, Dylan, in, in the book, whether he lives with disability or whether he uh, he dies as a baby. Your family life was involved, other, other books as well, because you've written um, a biography kind of lifestyle thing based on uh, articles you were writing for a magazine, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, I wrote um, I wrote columns for a regional magazine, Cotswold Life, for about 10 years. And I really loved doing it. And then I moved away from the Cotswolds. And then what happened was my 
editor from that magazine sort of reminded me that they were my columns, you know, that I, I owned the, the rights to them. And if I ever wanted to do anything with them, then, then I, I could do. And that coincided with me wondering what else I could do to support a charity of which I'm patron. So the Silver Star Society is a, a very small but very important charity in Oxfordshire based at, at the hospital where I had my children. And they support families going through high risk pregnancies. So I was fortunate enough to be supported by this charity when I had my children and um, my children would not be here without them. So mm. I'm, I'm their patron and I, I do small things. You know, I, I divert some fees that I if I'm offered a fee for doing a, um, a speaking event or a literary festival, then that goes directly to the charity. And, and I was wondering what else I could do. And then I spoke to my agent and said, look, you know, I've got these columns. Could I self-publish them maybe? And, and the proceeds could go to the charity. And she said, well, let's let's see if if we can, you know, publish them traditionally. And they approached, my agent approached my publishers and the publishing house really liked them so I added bits and changed bits and, and created a, a a narrative a seasonal um, narrative and they've all been published as a Cotswold family life so it's very different to crime it's uh, there are columns in there that are, that are quite poignant and there are lots of columns that are quite funny and it's a bit of a glimpse I suppose into my life as a as a mother as well as a writer back when I lived in the Cotswolds. Um. As you as you write in those columns, um, what would you say was the the biggest event that you included in the book that you'd you'd uh, that you enjoyed writing? Yeah. I think the, the biggest event is is at the end of the book, which is when I when we left when we left the Cotswolds, which was a really big moment in our lives, and we so we'd lived there for um, twelve. 15 years I suppose um, and then we, we just had a, a kind of a moment of, of madness and, and had this big life shift and left there and moved to Snowdonia in North Wales and my husband left his job um, to, to, have, to have the kids, to look after the kids and I, I was writing and travelling and it was such a huge shift moving to a Welsh speaking area where the kids go to school in Welsh and have all their education in Welsh. Uh, and that, you know, that's something that I wrote as I was writing the book. So that wasn't a column that, that existed. It was a, a, um, a something I added um, to finish the book. And it was quite emotional, I suppose, sort of revisiting that that decision that we made and thinking, you know, was it was it the right one? And I think it was. As, as um, moving around the country, does that change your writing style up in any way? What do you think? Yeah, I think it does. And I've really noticed it over the last 18 months when we haven't been traveling. I have struggled to find the creative space and the freedom that I generally find in hotel rooms and on trains and aeroplanes and sitting in cafes in countries where I don't speak the language, where I can't be interrupted. You know, no, no one's, I'm away from family life the kids aren't going to come into the office. No one's going to ring the doorbell. I, I'm totally in my own world for an hour or so. And I love that. And I really miss it. Yeah. Before we, I move on to ask some more questions, I'm going to just going to say to the audience that in the last 15 minutes, I will go to audience questions. There are some on the side at the minute, but I'm just going to leave that until the last 15 minutes because it's only a couple. Um, I just wondered, Claire, um, what what was next for you? After so what's next is a book, the title of which I don't yet know. So I have got a possible title, but I don't know if it's the right one yet. I might talk to you privately about it, Alex, and just, just bounce it off you and you can tell me what you think of it as a title. That's, that's fine. I do like titles. I do like coming up with them. Um, so yeah. it hasn't got a title. It is, as I said earlier, possibly the start of a series. I don't know. It depends on how readers take it to it, I suppose. Yeah. It's set in North Wales, uh, which is where I live, in a fictional community 
with a lake and the border between England and Wales runs right the way through the middle of the lake. And on the English side of the lake is a very exclusive, beautiful log cabin resort with decks that stretch over the lake. And on the Welsh side is a very small, very rural community. And on New Year's Day, when the locals go into the water for their traditional bracing New Year's Day swim, a body floats through the mist from the English side to the Welsh side. So it's a cross-border investigation. We meet Fionn Morgan, who is a, a female Welsh detective, and uh, her, um, her opposite number from England, Leo Brady. Um, and I love both of them. I love their relationship. I love The Shore, which is my, um, my fictional development on the English side of the lake. And yeah, I've loved writing it and I can't wait to come back. Have you had, because um, you, you were thinking about um, writing this for a while, because I saw you on, on your own Facebook book talking about it. Um, what is it about lake, the lake that made you decide to go for it? Because it's a, it's a, it's a unique thing, isn't it? A lake. Can... I love... So I really like Nordic um, crime. You know, Scandinavian crime. I love the atmosphere that you get in in those sorts of novels and in um, television dramas, and I feel a lot of that in North Wales. So I live in a very beautiful part of Snowdonia in a, a town with about 2000 people. We're surrounded by mountains. We've got this huge lake in the town and I swim and I paddleboard and walk the dogs there. And I love it all year round. It looks different every single day. I love the mist that lies low over the water early in the morning. And I just wanted to write about this part of the world. Um, I think a lot of people, when they think of Wales, they automatically think of Cardiff in the way that a lot of English people are very London centric. And North Wales is a part of the world that isn't very well represented in uh, fiction. So I'm excited yeah. to introduce people to my fictional part of Snowdonia. I'm going, to, I'm going to go back a question and ask you about titles because I believe Hostage, you asked the book group for a hand with it um, to come up with the title. What was that like, the discussions in the group talking about that? Yeah, I often ask my Facebook groups and um, Facebook pages for suggestions, uh, names of characters, names of boats, all sorts of things. I so hostage is not a title that that came from the group there were there were lots of um good suggestions there were lots of funny suggestions as well including uh british clairways um which obviously was be the title that we loved um and uh, lots of other silly silly suggestions uh but i i titles are really hard you know it's such it's like it's like naming your child isn't it, it it's such a permanent Thing. It's going to be there forever. And I I don't know, it feels like a massive weight of responsibility. So often it's my editors who come up with titles and I generally love them. It's quite funny because when I start my writing, I don't start a story unless I've got a title. Mm. Um, the, title is, the title is always my starting point. And if it steps away too far from the title, that's where the idea goes. So I think that might be my problem. I think <laughs> my title's too much, yeah. But does, do you ever change your title? Um, I have done, but uh, I, I, yeah, I find it very difficult to move away from the idea. And the, if the title changes, then the, book, the idea will change. <laughs> I feel that they're tied together, but I don't know whether me being a bit weird. You know, I don't think it's weird at all. I often have a working title, but yeah. I put on my document, I say it's a working title. So to kind of give myself the freedom to change it later. But I often change uh, titles, character names, I'll change between drafts. If I feel I want a fresh look at it, I want it to feel like it's a new document, a new book, I will change the title, change the character and give myself a new perspective on it. Yeah, um, I think I think um, because I'm working with multiple people anyway, 
I've always got multiple perspectives when I'm writing, so I, I think that's my problem. It's I'm, because I don't work on here, and it's a bit, bit, bit of a weird thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, when you when you were um um this year, you uh, won the short story dagger. Um, is writing short stories different to the long long form? Yes, it's much harder. Yeah. I find yeah. short stories really hard, but I think I'm getting slightly better at them. So yeah. I uh, I wouldn't write short stories for a long time because they were too difficult. And then I wrote The Donor, which isn't exactly a short story. It's a novella. So The, the Donor um, is part of the Quick Reads program. So yeah. it's about a quarter the length of a standard novel. It's just a pound, so it's a great way of trying out new authors, and there are loads of them, um, and they're all really brilliant. So I wrote The Donor, which was an idea that I'd had that didn't quite work as a full-length novel. So it was great to have the opportunity to then write it as a, as a novella. And that gave me a bit of confidence because people liked it. I also did a short story in, another, in a quick reads anthology, so I did a story called The Funeral, which was a very short, I think it was only 1,500 words, maybe 2,000 words with a little twist. And then I was invited to write something for Goldsboro. So Goldsboro Books is one of my favourite bookshops. Uh, they were doing an anthology uh, to celebrate their 21st anniversary. And it was such an honour to be asked that I had to say yes, couldn't turn it down. But then, of course, I had to write a story and I knew I wanted to write a story with a twist. And so for ages, I brainstormed twists, um, came up with this one that was a little bit like I Let You Go in that it's quite an audacious twist. It's, you know, it's quite bold. And um, it was quite tricky to, to write it. But anyway, it worked and I won a dagger for it. So I'm feeling quite inspired. And I'm hoping that in the next few years, I will be able to put together enough short stories to make an anthology well i hope to say that short stories are my back because that's what i've been writing but there we go they uh, definitely are back people people love reading short stories yeah uh, we we do have um short story competitions in the group um what advice would you give for someone that was starting one starting a short story yeah Gosh, I'm not sure I'm qualified, really. I feel like I'm just beginning at short stories. Um, I I mean, I all I can say is how I approach them. And I approach them by planning them quite meticulously and working out where, where the beats are. So working out where the twist is and where the, the kind of the, the three act structure is, is going to fall. Um, and then I ignore word count. So if it's, you know, if I, if I want to write a 3000 word story, I ignore that and I write really long because then the editing process, I will go back and I'll strip out things that aren't, aren't necessary. Um, but I think it's the same, the same advice that I'd give for, for writing a, a novella or a, or a novel, which is to, to make it, make it hooky, make it relatable, um, you know, make sure you, you know that you can entice the reader in from the outset. Well, I, uh, I hope that um, people out there in the group um, in, enjoy that little tip and will go to all these questions. If, I don't know whether you can see I'm along the side, Claire. I can, yeah, I can. Hello, everyone. Hi, Andrew in Nottingham. Hi, Marion. Hi, Samantha. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Yeah, if you can pick, if you can um, spot a question. Right. Yeah. I can. So Marion would like to know, do you ever not finish a book if you're not enjoying it? And the answer is yes. So for years and years, I was absolutely adamant that I had to read everything and finish everything. And now I just think that life is too short. So if I don't like it, I won't finish it. Um, I've got lots of books on my shelves that I'm sent prior to publication and I tend to pick them up, have a, a little um, squiz through the first few pages. And if I'm not gripped, then I won't read it at all. And then if I get to 
I don't know, maybe 10 chapters in and I'm just not excited by it. I, I won't read it. And that kind of, if I don't love it, I, I won't finish it. Um, so yeah, I'm quite brutal now. There's no one being brutal. What, what is it about the, the proof copies? The covers change, don't they? Yeah. Covers change, did you say? Yeah, and proof copies that you get sent. Because the covers are what I look for when I'm looking for a new book. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because we, you, you're right, with a finished book, we're looking at the finished cover and that's part of our, our reason for reading. Um, but of course, I'm sort of looking at my, my proof shelf. A lot of them don't have anything at all. Some of them are, are just bound copies with no cover. They're just plain white. And I quite like that in a way because I have to decide just from perhaps a sheet of information that's come with it or just from the opening pages. So it it's almost feels like a better way of selling a book because it has to stand yeah. on its own. Have we got any more questions in there? I don't know. I can't read them. Off. We have. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. I've got them. Um, so it's great. Andrew says he's looking forward to the Welsh mystery. Thank you very much. Um, and you also want to know whether Hostage is on audio, and it is. So um, it yes. should be definitely on Audible, should be available from your library. If it's not, then ask them for it because they should be able to get it. Samantha Brownlee attended a story course that I held online. Which one was that? I don't remember that. How often do I run courses and do I have any coming up? I don't do it very often because it's really time consuming. And also I'm not a teacher. I, I am a, a writer. And sometimes I try and share what I do. But, you know, there are lots of people who do brilliant courses um, far better than I do. So I do some physical in-person courses sometimes. I've um, done a couple for uh, a place in North Wales called Teenaweth, which is a residential uh, arts centre. Absolutely amazing place. Beautiful location, brilliant food, great tuition. So that's a lovely place to go. I'm doing one online in about three weeks time, I think, which is about, uh, this is more for people who are writing already and have an established, you know, they're, they're either published or they're nearly published and they're building an author uh, platform. And that's on how to write a newsletter. Um, other than that, I don't think I've got anything coming up. But if you subscribe to my mailing list, then you'll always get information about the courses that I might be teaching on. Okay, I don't think there are any other questions. Okay, have you got any, anything that you want you want to tell the audience about that we've not covered yet? Oh, I think just how brilliant this group is, and how you know how I, I'm so interested in how um, Facebook has um, kind of created a completely new environment for readers. Uh, it, it's it's so brilliant to have book clubs where you don't need to leave your house, you don't need to travel, you don't need to worry about accessibility. You can do it from your house and you can connect with book lovers from all over the world. Um, I, I think that's just really brilliant. Have you noticed a, a change over the pandemic? Have, have people been more likely to join a group like this? Well, it's more than doubled in size since since I started the uh, with the interview team. Uh, and we're nearly at 20,000 members now. We're only about um, two, I think it's about maybe 200 off that. That's uh, amazing, that's yeah. really fantastic. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, uh, over the year and a bit that I've been doing this, I've read so many, interesting stuff and there's so many interesting authors in in the group that i'm waiting to uh, read when when i can get the technology to read and through not on audio because there's technology out there and it's coming so um yeah i'm really looking forward to helping some of the members of the group out um what um made you decide to set up your own book group and what are the, what's the bits you enjoy about doing that? I set up my book 
which is very egotistically called the Claire McIntosh Book Club. Um, egotistical and unoriginal, um, but there you have it. Because I was sending an author newsletter once a month and that was fine, but I don't really like doing that. I don't like sending an email that's just about me. And I started to put in information about what I was reading and other things I was doing. And actually what people really wanted to know was what I was reading and then they wanted to talk about it with me and people would reply and say, oh, I've just read that too. So I thought I will I will stop doing a, a newsletter that's all me, 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 and I will create a book club and we'll read a book every month together and we'll talk about it online. And I've really loved it because it's been great to push ourselves out of our comfort zone a little bit um, and try books that I might not necessarily read. It's been great to share books that I love with a, a wider audience and sometimes make a bit of a difference if those books aren't particularly well known or perhaps they're with a small publisher. It's really lovely to share them. So I, I like all of it. You know, as you know, it's a lot of work to, to manage an online community, but it's it's really rewarding. I meet lots of interesting people. And I like the fact that it's in a group rather than just open Facebook. It's a, you know, a relatively safe space. Everyone is really respectful and supportive and polite. And I've really enjoyed seeing that side of the internet because over on Twitter, it's not always quite as supportive no. and lovely. It's quite a different environment. How do you select the books for the, for the book group? Because that must be very I good. have no system, no system at all. They are books that I've, um, I've either loved them and want to share them or I think they'll stimulate debate, or sometimes it's a book that I haven't read and I feel I should. So last year, or right at the start of this, this year maybe, I can't remember, anyway, I had never read a Patricia Highsmith book, which is a terrible, terrible admission for a crime writer. So I thought I'm going to read one, let's have it as a book club pick, and then we can talk about it and I'll have to read it. So I chose Strangers on a Train, uh, and I hated it. Um, so <laughs> there was lots to talk about, but I, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't, I just didn't get it. I didn't get all the hype. And so sometimes that's quite a good thing about book club is that you, you read a classic and you talk about, you know, why is it a classic and whether you like it or, or, you know, why, why you don't like it. But people are surprised when you say you don't like something because I don't, I don't like to, if I don't, if I don't really, if I hate a book, I just won't review it at all. I'm just like, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Patricia Highsmith, I think, can, can cope um, without without my praise. Uh, generally speaking, I will only say that I don't like something if the author is not alive anymore um, or is just never going to hear about it. You know, it's they're so enormous that it really doesn't yeah. matter. Otherwise, like you, my rule is if I didn't love it, I don't talk about it. And that's and that's why. And the only place that I will write it is in my little blue book. And out of the so I haven't read as many books as you this year. I have read 50 books this year and I've got asterisks next to the ones that I loved. And so far this year, one, two, eight. 16 books I've loved out of 50 and the others I will never mention online. That was that must be a challenge to um, decide on the six. How many of the 16 have you shared with the book group? Um, I don't think any of them have, because of the timing, yeah. these are generally books that I've read that perhaps aren't out yet. I don't think any. Oh, so one of them is is um, my current book club pick, which is Louise Beach's This is How We Are Human. And that's superb. That's um, about uh, the mother of an adult man with um, autism who wants to have a relationship, wants to have a sexual relationship. And she hires an escort to fulfill his his needs and, and wants. And so it's a book about ethics and how far we go to support the people that we love it's a really brilliant book 
Yeah, I must admit, I've been looking forward to tr trying to read that, but I'm not sure well, whether it's a bit too close to home for myself. So. <laughs> I, I, yeah. yeah, I think it's a really it's a really interesting one because it de it redefines a lot of people's um, preconceptions, I suppose, and judgments about what people want and what a relationship is, and you know who should be uh, be able to have a relationship. And there are an awful lot of people in our society who have physical disabilities, who have psychological impairments or learning difficulties, they are just as entitled to meet people and have, you know, physical relationships um, as, as anybody else. And, and I, I, I thought it was brilliantly written, actually. It is quite emotional. Um, and I have people in my family with uh, with disabilities who are in similar situations um, and I found it really very thought provoking so I'd urge people to read it. Well I'm definitely going to give it a go then I might have to wait a few months when when I'm ready to read it but yeah yeah and um, I'd be really interested to see what the rest of the group thinks I know it's not generally a crime book but there is bit which does write crime um, what is it like when other when authors um, generally write in other genres? I know you've done it yourself, but um, what, do you find it interesting when they write in other genres too? Yeah, that is I am a massive fan of authors just writing the story they want to write. And I hate the fact that we put things in boxes and on shelves and it's very much driven by online shopping because in a physical bookshop, yeah, there might be there might be shelves that are called crime or romance, but actually, you know, Waterstones is a great example. If you walk into a Waterstones in the UK, the the a lot of the books are displayed on tables, and they're not generally on the tables. They're not generally categorised by genre. They're categorised by new releases or selling well or you know hot summer reads. They're they're kind of grouped by feel. And it's a really great way of discovering new authors because you're drawn to covers or to particular displays. But online, we are funneled into categories and then subcategories and then sub subcategories, and that creates real niches. And then we struggle with the fact that an author wants to write in a different niche. Whereas actually a good story is a good story and it doesn't matter what shelf it sits on. Yeah. Um... I'm just thinking about shelves, shelves that things sit on. Well, audio books are their own genre in themselves, but yours are um, pretty unique because they've got multiple narrators. How, how do you feel about it when you heard them or do you not hear them? Oh, I do hear them. Yeah, I, I, I hear the um, uh, kind of audition samples when we're deciding on which narrators to have. And sometimes, so after the end, was an interesting example because we needed a male actor and all the samples that came through were really strong men so so they they this particular um uh, actor who sounded really good he'd done lots of male detectives in other crime novels but they're always very strong and max in after the end has you know he is quite a strong man but he's also going through an incredible incredibly emotional experience and i couldn't find a single sample online where a male actor was you know sort of overcome by emotion and i think it's you know it's quite telling really in in our fiction and in the way that fiction reflects society that we don't allow men to do this but we had to ask um an actor to to specifically record a piece of the the book where where the character broke down so that we could get a sense for how he would handle those scenes. So that's kind of the input that I have in, into the process. I listen to, to bits and, and we have a conversation about it. Sometimes we have to talk about how we're going to narrate something without spoiling the twist. So Hostage is a really good example of that. And again, I'll be a little bit careful about how I explain this, but if it were to be voiced by multiple narrators, it would be very hard to pull off one of the twists. Yeah. So in order to make it 
watertight and to make it work for the reader, the listener, we had to have one narrator for that and have it told as a story rather than have it sort of voiced by actors, if, if that makes sense. as a sort yeah. of subtle fiction between the two um, because it is, uh, you know, it relies on identity and, um, and issues of who a particular character is. Yeah, it's very, um, it's a very different book and I would urge people to definitely give it a go because I really enjoyed it and I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to thank your publishers for sending us a copy. Oh, it's a pleasure. You know you're always top of my list when it comes to advanced copies. Thank you very much. And uh, just just to end on, because um, we've got Louise Lou, Candice next Monday, because you spoke to her, Harriga. what was that like speaking to her? It was brilliant. I love Louise. I've met her a couple of times. I've been fortunate enough to have a, a dinner with her. Um, we share an agent, which is lovely. So it was nice to do an event with her. And, um, and we write in very different ways. And what was really interesting about that event is that we talked about success. And both of us have had um, a, a degree of success. We've been very fortunate in our careers, but at very different stages. So I was kind of plummeted into um, the, the success with I, I Let You Go, which, which was a hit from, from the outset. And Louise had written a number of books um, and, and was making a, a sort of a living as a writer, but hadn't broken out until Our House, which was a huge global bestseller. So we came at things from very different perspectives, and it was really interesting to talk to her about how that impacts our, our writing. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about that. That very thing. Thank you so much, Claire. And uh, I hope that everybody will enjoy tomorrow's event too. Thank you for having me. Thanks very much. And um, see you all you guys tomorrow. Yeah. Still running. Sorry guys, it's me switching.